Welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak. Once again, asking you to please continue to keep Dave and Faith Matthews from American Pride Roasters Coffee in your prayers. They're still rebuilding there following the devastating tornado that took everything from them in March. Uh, when they get things going again, back on their feet, uh, over at aprcoffee.com, uh, we will definitely let you know. Until then, do continue to keep Dave Faith and APR Coffee in your prayers. Thank you. You're listening to At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. My friend Kay Smythe sits down with us this week on At The Mic. Kay was born and raised across the pond in Wales, where she had a unique childhood before heading to America as an adult. After a dramatic stint in Los Angeles, she made her way to North Carolina, where she resides today, trying to save her new country that she loves so dearly. Today, we sit down with Kay Smythe for this edition of At The Mic. Kay, how are you doing today? I'm good, Keith. I'm good. I'm happy to be here. It's been a busy day, but I'm loving it. How are you doing? Ah, sorry. One of my cats just jumped on my lap. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so how... So hold on, here we go. Between your cats jumping all over you here during this conversation and the fact that before we began recording, my earbuds dropped out, my hardwire connection uh, earbuds dropped out, this is going to be, uh, there There are a lot of landmines uh, potentially uh, for this conversation, so we're going to do our best <laughs> to make this work. Oh no. So how many cats do you have, by the way? I have I have three Siamese cats. I I did not plan to have three Siamese cats, but my family right. only has Siamese cats, as it like turns out. Like we've only ever for like three generations of the Smythe family, only ever had Siamese cats. And I'm just carrying it on that tradition. And they're great, but I have You gotta stop. Yeah. Yeah. Let, don't let people know that, that you collect Siamese cats and maybe people will stop giving them to you as gifts. Oh my gosh. Nothing would make... Ow! Sorry. One of them just literally clawed me and slapped me across the face with her tail. She's the worst one, but she's also the cuddliest. Anyone with cats, uh -huh. I feel like knows that... Like I have a dog as well, yeah. but I feel like if you have mm -hmm. cats, you know they have like these in incredibly persistent, <laughs> detailed personalities where you love them, but in a split second, they will do something that not only hurts you like physically, but like really hurts your feelings. And they're like, not great <laughs> house guests. You know, they're like, oh, I'm gonna rub on you. I'm gonna rub on you. And now I'm gonna bite you. They're they, just the absolute worst. Do you have pets? Two dogs, uh, there's a bird and there's a rabbit. Uh, hmm. So, uh, but we had a high watermark of four cats as well. Um, so we had you beat by one cat, but I imagine because it, it's just you, right? It's just you, the three cats, and the dog. And so they seriously outnumber you. Oh, yeah. Like, if I, you know, like, choke to death or, like, just drop dead in my apartment, <laughs> these guys will eat me before anyone realizes that <laughs> I've died. It's going to be... Oh, no. I can think of worse ways to go. Like, I really can. Um, but, yeah, uh. apparently as well, I, like, one of my friends told me that when cats eat dead bodies, they start with the face and i was like oh that's so dark oh <laughs> that is so oh, dark. hide the kids yeah. oh no you know. that is uh <laughs> okay well you keep us up to date on the um claw count uh we're up to uh how many we got one or two uh so far uh um, I'll keep, yeah i'll keep a little tally. incidences on that <laughs> yeah okay so uh you, you were born in south wales yes okay now i try to figure this out is wales a country or is it a part of Great Britain? Or is it a little bit of both? Good grief, I can't figure it out. Okay, so I, you do not beat yourself up over this. The geography of Britain <laughs> is a nightmare. And I have a geography degree and like I still get like stressed ah. out trying to think about it. So Wales, Wales is its own country. We have our own language, we have our own government, but we are still part of Great Britain and like the British Isles or the UK. However you want to sort of refer to it, it has like too many names. So the UK is both geographically and socially, um, I guess, an archipelago. So it's it's a collection of four different countries um, across a sort of stratified like landmass. There's like lots of little islands. So there's Wales, Scotland, England and Northern Ireland. 
And then there's all these like other very, very small jurisdictions that aren't technically their own countries. So there's like places like Guernsey, okay. the Isle of Wight. And then Wales is obviously the best one, you know, like it, it, the Welsh language and Wales as a nation, like far outdates England, which is weird because England technically in many ways tries at least to a certain extent to rule us. But Wales and sort of like our heritage, our culture, our language has been around for like hundreds of thousands of years. Whereas the like England is more of an amalgamation of like everyone that's ever invaded. Whereas like anyone who's ever tried to invade Wales is like, you can assimilate or we will eat you. Like it's one or the other. Uh Like we can be chill. And we'll start with the face. Yeah, and we'll start with the face. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. There's so much here that uh, <laughs> that I need to unpack. I think you just mentioned in there you have a major in geography. All right, mm-hmm. is that because what you do is very unique and it's, it has nothing to do, it seems, on the surface anyway, to do with your geography degree. So I'm having a tough time figuring out where to go. Do we start with what you do, where people can find you, and then and then after you establish that, then let's go back to Wales and 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 explore your childhood and how you ended up with a geography degree. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. All right. So where can people find you right now? Because I met you through a mutual friend of ours, Ian Patterson, mm. who's going to be on a future episode of this podcast at the mic, and 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 so you two are are just great people. And he tells me how you guys escaped, I think, Los Angeles about the same time, right? Oh, yeah. Ian, (laughs) like, I wouldn't have left L.A. if it weren't for Ian. Like, Ian Ian started this whole ball rolling. Like, I don't know what I would do without Mm -hmm. that man. Um, He is a... Him, his wife, you know, they have a new baby, like just salt of the earth, beautiful people. He introduced me to this guy, Jeremiah Wilbur, who runs a group called the War Party Movement, who rescue women, children from um, abuse, amongst other things. They do a lot of rehabilitation work as well. Um, And so Mm -hmm. Ian introduced me to Jeremiah. Jeremiah and I uh, became very close friends as well. And then I was actually the first rescue, but it kind of like all roads really lead back to Ian. And and that's just kind of a sneak peek of my conversation with Ian, because he is truly a great American hero. And I mean that from um, what you just mentioned, his efforts there, and also with Afghanistan and the Operation Pineapple. Mm. Um, Anyway, the the guy is, like you said, salt of the earth. And, And it was so ironic that he and I realized, wait a minute, we are literally like 20 miles from each other and we had no idea. Um, but anyhow, explain to us what it is that you do right now, because I see you everywhere. I mean, you're everywhere, ubiquitous, if you will. Mm-hmm. And you have a lot of great information on a lot of stuff. How did you get involved with places? Well, I'm just going to let you I'm just going to let you tell us all the places that you are, what you do, what you talk about, where your expertise is, because it just seems like you've come a long way from a geography degree. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, that's I mean, thank you for your kind words. Uh, firstly, um, so I guess blanket term, I just refer to myself as a writer and um, I met like, you know, there are so many, you know, there are millions of writers out there in the world. And uh, to be able to live and work in the United States, uh, I really had to kind of develop a specialism within the world of writing that no one else does. And so I'll like, I'll get into sort of like my degree and all that kind of stuff uh, later, earlier, later. See, I'm such a good writer. Um, (laughs) But uh, basically right now you can find me. So I'm with Joe Pags. Joe Pag show on mm-hmm. uh, Mondays. I do sort of uh, K's Cray News of the Week or like Cray News with K, like whatever the heck we're calling it. <laughs> I know. You know, it's just the I, crazy it took you all forever to try do. to figure out what to call it. <laughs> I know. We were like going back and forth. And I was just like, dude, I don't even like write the own, like my own headlines because I just don't know how to do that. Like I do like block quotes, like big words in order. Um, so (laughs) basically, um, yeah, Mondays I do with Joe and then every now and again, he has this incredible newsreader, uh, Carrie, 
and she every now and again if she's like taking night off I'll come on I'll like again be sort of like a talking head I'll find news stories and then as well as that I work with the Daily Caller who are just I think a brilliant outlet so much fun to work with uh just a real sort of like it's like what the Rolling Stone was back in the day um but for you know sort of like slightly more conservative leaning but still like very rock and roll and I just again like I sort of have my the freedom to write about and talk about whatever I want to write and talk about with them uh I also do some work with the National Pulse I work for Raheem Kassam and then there's like a couple of other people who kind of like bleed into the ownership there who are just again like you like you'll know all of these people through like social media through television And to be quite honest with you, Keith, I have no idea how I ended up here. I mean, I can like go back down the line, but I actually came to the United States as like a very sort of like leftist socialist person, woman. And then I moved to California and I was like, wow, I am, I do not agree with like any of what these guys are saying from that kind of like political side of the aisle. And I'm also seeing the sort of short and long-term consequences of that kind of socialist rhetoric. And I can see where they're just getting stuff really wrong. And it, I found it to be like a very uh, anti-American sentiment. Like I find California in general, the sort of liberal policies there to be very anti-American. And I was like, I didn't leave the UK to come and live amongst like all the same problems that I just left and have less freedom. I moved to America for this idea of freedom. And so pretty much everyone that I work with right now I think really embodies that like core ideology of American culture that we should all be proud of. Like, I guess a couple of months ago or a month ago, I wrote a piece on uh, CNN, for example, Um, but sort of all the naughtiness that was going on at CNN. And I got contacted by Newsmax to go on and say like, hey, we read this article. We'd love for you to come on and talk about it. And so like, I just don't say no to stuff. Like if someone wants to have a conversation, (laughs) I'll have it. Um, I said a lot of stuff that really didn't make it into the piece that I wrote. And so I'm sort of in this like (laughs) weird, like uh, space. So geography, I think a lot of people think that geography is like maps and like, you know, ocean stuff. And it is, it's geography is everything. And that's why I, I mean, I got a it. minor in geography. It seems like that's what we learned unless the University of Nebraska jobbed me. What, what was your <laughs> geography degree like? Well, there's like this sort of running joke with geography, like geography students that if you go into a geography degree as a physical geographer, you'll graduate as a human geographer and vice versa. I went in very much like, I'm going to study volcanoes and I'm going to go work for FEMA and I'm going to do disaster relief. And I was like very gung ho about that kind of stuff. And I'd always written, like I was just always like interested in putting words in order and, you know, sharing my perspective from the data that I had access to. And then it turns out that I'm terrible at math. Like I am the worst mathematician in the world. And so <laughs> join the club. Oh my God. It's the, <laughs> and like, you know, I find that to be like kind of a trend with people who work in media. Like we're not data, like data driven <laughs> people tend to, um, you know, go and work for like technology companies, things like that. And I, uh, yeah. so I went into my degree being like all gung ho about like volcanoes and things like that. And then ended up just falling in love with like human geographies. So it's like, how people interact with the planet, how people interact with one another, how cultures form. So it's everything from like, you know, sort of the anthropological like evolution of society to, you know, like even like, okay. So my, my specialization then I guess is using qualitative data to do uh, trend forecasting. And that's all I really write about. Mm -hmm. Like I spin it as sort of like a more article, like small, like bits of, you know, digestible information on like current events. But really it's just like, let me look at the qualitative data that I have available. Let me analyze it with like past human trends. And let's kind of like package this all up to tell the story in a way that maybe gives people not necessarily like information that they couldn't get elsewhere, but get information that will allow them to see how this has unfolded and to see how... A different perspective, yeah. right? A different perspective. Yeah, and it's okay, all so Sorry, that's my soliloquy. Thank you. Right. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's good. So I'm glad you mentioned your writing because that is, before you started making appearances everywhere, you were doing prolific writing. And my question for you is, 
what percentage of your work would you say actually has your name attached to it? And what percentage of it has someone else's name attached to it? But you were the one behind the scenes pulling all this stuff together. Oh my gosh, that is such a good question. Yeah, I didn't even like mention the private sector stuff. Um, gosh, I would say like probably less than 20% of the work that I've ever mm. done has my own name attached to it. I've ghostwritten for right. years mm -hmm. for a bunch of different sectors. I do, a cause like, again, writing is just like nonfiction writing is just research. And so I've worked with like loads of mm -hmm. like tech companies, cannabis companies. Oh my gosh. Like even like media companies on like the back end. And it's like, oh, you need a problem solved or a question answered. I like, I will find that information and I will do that. Do you need deep investigative information and have it written up in a way that you can translate it easily to, you know, maybe an audience that doesn't necessarily, you know, have the same like background information. Like I got you and I love doing that stuff. <laughs> I love doing that stuff. Like I really do. Okay. I got drag kicking and screaming back into journalism, literally. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, so, <laughs> so how many hours a day would you say that you spend writing? Minimum. For, for whoever. Minimum eight. That's my absolute minimum. I do like Monday to Friday. Weekends, mm. I try to take it a little bit easier. But yeah. Yeah. Like writing is also rewriting. So it doesn't matter what I write. I'm going to have to edit it at some point. So hmm. it's just, and I have like a book project that I'm working on right now on long haul COVID and like my agent. I'm seriously, you, know, <laughs> you stay incredibly busy. Mm -hmm. So you grew up though in a camper van, right? <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> God, you did your research. Um, yeah, my parents bought. Um, I mean, I'm just reading the email you sent. Oh, that. really? God, I don't even <laughs> remember sending that. Jeez. See, just words in order. And I'm like, did I really write that? Um, yeah, like my parents <laughs> bought our first camper van in like 1990, I want to say like six, maybe 95, might have been a bit later. And like, yeah, every summer we would just like take off and just follow the sun around like France. It sounds like really luxurious and like frilly, but it's just like, I didn't live where I live now in North Carolina. It's the first time I've ever lived somewhere where there isn't sand in everything. Like everywhere I've ever <laughs> lived, there has just been sand everywhere. Um, but yeah, right. camper van, like very bohemian, very chill. Like my mother can cook like a freaking six course meal on a tiny little like coal powered barbecue. And it's like the best meal you'll ever have. So, you know, I had, a, I will say I had like a very, I had a great childhood. I love the van. I think if I had my driver's license out oh. here, I would probably <laughs> still be living in a van. It was, uh, here's what I, I, <laughs> so I looked this up, you know, cause, uh, like you, I like research. I like to look things up, you know. And um, I'm looking to see right now that uh, Wales is similar in size to the U.S. state of Rhode Island. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I, there's not a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm not. I, I mean, just like, like if you were living your life in the back of a camper van driving around Rhode Island, did you not just basically? Make a big circle every day and get back to where you started in the morning. I don't know. Well, like we have, we have like a home. Like my parents like still live in the family home that uh, I grew up in. They bought it before. Oh my bad. Yeah. So no. I should stop being so literal. No. You didn't exactly just life on the road. I see now. It was just. I'm sorry. Us, you were just kind of uh, you know like, painting a picture yeah. for me, and I, I I read too deep. I'm sorry. No, okay. no, no, not at all. My bad. That, that makes sense. My parents that makes sense. just hate okay. when I talk about them. So you know. No, we used to get. France like <laughs> France is like spitting distance from Wales like you can get to France mm. like if you leave like first thing in the morning you'll be like halfway down France by like the night um it only takes like wow. half an hour to get there on the channel tunnel and I hate boats oh well I don't hate boats I don't like cruise liners like I always get like do you get seasick mm -hmm. have you ever been seasick yeah not really no I'm, I'm good with that okay it is the worst in my opinion like i've i've gotten food poisoning before and i'd rather have food poisoning again than go through seasickness like it is mm. horrendous but um yeah so no like i mean you know we and i found this out actually on one of the camper van trips down to i think we we're going to spain we had to go through the bay of biscay which has like eight to 12 foot swells when it's like a calm day and me and my mom were just like no this is not this is not gonna work for us again let's just take the <laughs> extra week and drive it 
Yeah. But yeah, camper van, camper van living is fun. It's very cool. Do you camp? Okay. Do you camp? Mm. Ish. Mm. Mm. I want to try glamping. Oh gosh. I want to. I want to. So I want to be like in the middle of nowhere under the stars. But uh, you know, I want to make sure that it's uh, nice, right? I don't want to be like actually under under the stars. Okay. Wait. Because there's you... other things that are under under the stars that could be crawling all over you. Oh my I want to be gosh. inside a nice... I'll go outside. I just would rather be conscious when I'm outside, all right? Okay, me, Don't and, judge me. me and Ian are going to have to change this because that's not... That's. I okay. mean, I slept outside when I was driving from California to North Carolina. We slept in the mm -hmm. bed of a truck um, a couple of nights and... I used to sleep, but when I lived in Joshua Tree, I would sleep outside. I hate sleeping indoors. I sleep way better outside than I do inside. Not like outside, like in a tent, like outside, like there's nothing else. I'm just on a bed outside. I would sleep in the, I would absolutely sleep in the bed of a truck. I'm not going to sleep on the ground ground. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I you know, I completely accept yeah. that. Um, yeah, but like, okay, even well, sleeping, fine. We're good. Yeah, we're good. good. We have but no, let, 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 let me put it to you this way. My son and I went on a camping trip with the Boy Scouts once. And uh, please forgive me, y'all, if I've already told this story. But it was a two night thing. And the Friday night was just, we ended up, even though we were like the first or second people to pitch our tent there, uh, we ended up getting surrounded by every other, uh, like, you know, 40 other tents. And oh my gosh, didn't realize how many men in this world snore and <laughs> snore loudly. And I had forgotten my earplugs and it was the most wretched experience. And so the next day I was just exhausted, just dead. I, I literally did not sleep at all. And I, by the way, I went camping multiple times with my son. And just like when I was his age... Every time I've gone camping, it's been a disaster. If I'm in charge, if, if I'm in charge of the tent, right? Like when I was with my friends in high school, they would do most of the stuff and I would just be there just enjoying myself. That was fine. <laughs> but when I'm the dad, when I'm in charge or something like that, it's just a disaster. Um, so anyway, where was I? Oh, so so the Saturday rolls around and and Ezra's allergies are acting up. I'm miserably tired. And they're about to start like the campfire, the Saturday night campfire. And maybe I embellished a little bit, but I told the scout leader, I'm like, yep, Ezra's allergies are just so darn acting up. And plus, he'd already <laughs> done all the activities anyway. I didn't take much from him other than the campfire. We ended up going to a hotel that was next door to a Cracker Barrel. And Kay, if I hadn't have left, I wouldn't have gotten to see that night the most dramatic ending to a Michigan-Michigan State game that was on the TV that <laughs> night with a, I think it was like a, a I don't figure it was a block pun or a, it went over the guy's head. And the, Anyway, my point is I would have missed out on that experience had I had stuck around. I do need my creature comforts and I have nothing against watching a TV while in a tent. I'm just telling you, I'm all for camping, but it just needs some kind of control to that environment. So you okay? need a grown up with you is what I'm hearing. Like you need someone uh -huh. to come and be the grown up. Okay, me and Ian will yeah. take you camping. We can be the grown ups. Uh -huh. It'll be great. Uh -huh. okay. It'll be so much fun. It'll be you know, it'll be great. Now, your er <laughs> your earliest memory was learning the alphabet on a beach. That sounds like fun. It was. Oh, my mom. Oh, she's so great. We used to go to these like pebble beaches. I can't remember if it was in like Greece or the Canary Islands or wherever. My goodness. Um, no, it sounds really posh. This was like back in the day. This is like sort of pre 9-11, <laughs> uh -huh. pre everything where you could go to like you know, the Canary Islands for like 10 days, like three people, and it would cost you like, you know, 50 quid or something. I don't know. Um, I'm going to get a phone call from my mother after this goes out and she's going to be like, you got everything wrong. Um, and she's <laughs> going to sound like that as well. But no, like she would. Um, <clears throat> Hi, mom. I know. Oh, my gosh. Forgive. Forgive me. Um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How much is 50 quid? Like, what's a quid? Oh, what's a quid? quid is like a, a pound sterling. So like, I guess like a dollar 30 probably right now ish. Gotcha. Um, but uh, okay. yeah, she would. So she taught me my <laughs> alphabet 
she would get the pebbles and write like a big A and then a little A and then a big B and a little B. Oh, that's great. And then I would have to like put them in order and we'd like spell <laughs> words. And I remember that vividly. I also remember the Siamese cats. Um, and then I'm absolutely 1000% convinced. We have a picture in my parents' house. Oh, one sec. I just got to deal with this cat. There we go. You just blow on them <laughs> and they go away. <laughs> you know, you could try a, a water bottle, like a squirt bottle. I, that would I that could. would do the trick. That too. would do the trick. Although I think one of my cats is into the water. He likes to try and get in the shower with me. It's a bit weird. My goodness. Yeah. But um, <laughs> wait, what we talk? Oh, yeah. So I have this picture in my parents' house where it's me as like almost a newborn. My dad, my grandfather, my grandpa John, and then grandfather's like almost like surrogate dad i would say so i I have a great grandfather but he died when my grandfather was um quite young and he's actually like he's pretty famous like he's got a mountain named after him and stuff wow yeah i'm well who's that what's the mountain oh it's literally called mount Smythe. it's in canada there's a wikipedia page and everything but my great grandfather was like this famous (laughs) mountaineer back in the day also not the nicest person under the sun according to literally everyone oh no yeah you know, it's pretty funny. I see it. It's in Alberta. I found it. Frank Smythe. Yeah, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. He's got a Wikipedia page, too. He sure does. He's a beautiful writer, I will say. Like, for as terrible as he probably was as a person, uh, he's a really exceptional <laughs> writer. His son did write a book about how terrible he was, though. Um, but that's a whole Oh, my that's gosh. A whole Listen to this. <laughs> you mentioned food poisoning. In 1949, you don't need me to tell you this, but uh, he got food poisoning, mm-hmm. and and then he got a bunch of malaria attacks, and my goodness, he died when he was 48. Yeah, and he was like, that's terrible. Well, he was actually tipped. They reckoned if he hadn't died, he probably would have been the first guy to make it to the summit of Everest, sort of predating wow. Hillary. Yeah, which is pretty cool. You know, it's like a nice little almost legacy right there. Um, but he's like, he's still like, he actually named this. Okay. So this is, this is very geography. He <laughs> wrote a book about this valley in, it's either in Nepal or India. And he called it the Valley of the Flowers. And to this day, it's known like the official name of this valley is Valley of the Flowers National Park. So he like named that entire national park, which is pretty cool, which I didn't find out until like a couple of years ago, even I was like, what? That's cool. That is very cool. Yeah, I was very impressed. That's cool. Yeah. And you got you got some interesting stuff in your uh, family background. Oh, yeah. You ended up going to Plymouth University. Mm-hmm. Where's that based out of? It's on the southwest coast of England. It's uh, like I'm from okay. a little town called Swansea, and it's basically the English version of Swansea. It's like a bit of a dump, but I had a great time. It was really great. Okay. Yeah. So you ended up majoring in geography there. I did. We've established that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you get from over there to over here? So I wrote for, I've always written, I used to lie about my age to get published. And I was writing and editing for uh, (laughs) my like college sort of uh, syndication of the tab which is like this big student newspaper um i was then scouted and wrote for uh the huffington post at the time and i was in the cinema one day with a friend of mine watching some like i don't know b-list horror film and i had wanted to do my thesis my dissertation on how men predominantly transition out of organized crime syndicates into like normal day-to-day life and like leave kind of organized crime, predominantly cartels, gangs, things like that. And then the university was like, absolutely not. Like that is like, you will not pass a risk assessment to do that kind of work, like choose something else. (laughs) And I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, But I was in the cinema and this guy walks on screen and I was like, okay, either this is the greatest actor of all time, or this guy is like legit ex-gang member. Turns out he was. Um, his name's Richard Cabral. He was subsequently nominated for an Emmy for a show called American Crime. He was, um, mm. now he's in sort of Mayans MC. And so a handful of the guys that are now in that show, Mayans MC, this was like before they even had like representation, some of them. 
like back when they were still like doing, you know, like odd jobs, like just left jail, just left prison. I somehow got in touch. I think it was like via like MySpace or Facebook with uh, Richard was like, hey, dude, can I write about you? He's like, absolutely. <laughs> um, also, you should come and visit us all in LA. And so I'm there like 21 years old. I've been to California a few times before. Loved it. Loved being there. Always felt very at home in California. And so I was just like, yeah, okay, I'll go and visit. Like, why not? Again, I say, I'll just say yes to anything, like, to be honest with you. I'm just like, yeah, I've got nothing else to do. And so I went out and <laughs> um, hung out in LA. I was supposed to be there for like three days, ended up staying for like basically the entire like three months, like 90 days that you can get of a visa. Um, like if you're just like traveling and I was just hanging out, like uh -huh. I was literally just here on vacation, hanging out with these guys. And they were like, you've got to keep writing about us. And then through being here, I met a lot of people who had like started reading my work. I bumped into this woman at a, like a 10 year old's birthday party or something who uh, turned out to be an immigration attorney. She was like, you have a huge case because I'd had like a lot of media back in the UK. She was like, you've got a huge case. Um, if you wanted to, to be able to come and work here, you have a lot of people asking you to come and work here. So I was like, yeah, go on then, let's do it. And so that's what I did. And I was mm -hmm. writing and researching for like all these different groups. It was really focused on um, these men though, these incredible men who had done so much wrong in their lives. And like, I, I you know, a couple of the guys who were, there's like sort of like a bit of like an inner circle. And there were a couple who I was like, these guys aren't going to make it. But there were a handful where I was like, oh my goodness, if these guys stick at their craft, they are going to be able to not only completely reinvent their lives and make, you know, obviously huge sums of money for themselves and just go on to be like incredible artists. But they're also going to represent that for a lot of other young men who are maybe given the option of like, hey, join the street gang, join this cartel, give up on your dreams of becoming a creative, give up on your dreams of becoming an artist um, and, you know, do all these things and then end up either dead or in prison. And so that's really what I wanted to shine a light on. And then they go and start a blimmin' TV show where they're all a bunch of gangsters. And it's like, <laughs> okay, I guess that's what we're doing then. Um, so it's like this bizarre, okay, did you, did you ever see Songs of Anarchy? I'm familiar with it. I have not watched it, no. So it's a show about um, uh, a motorcycle gang out in the California desert. Right. And there was a direct, right. so this is some geography. This is the human geography that I used to do. There was a direct correlation between the release of Sons of Anarchy and the growth in motorcycle gangs across the United States. Like there was this huge resurgence. And then as soon as Sons of Anarchy went off air, it's a brilliant show, by the way. Like, I mean, if you've ever seen Yellowstone, it's one of the same guys who did that, does Yellowstone. And then mm. as soon as it went off air, um, that kind of fad like kind of pitted out a bit. And then they just completely re-released it with a predominantly uh, Latin cast. Like, uh, I think most of the guys in it are either from Los Angeles and their ancestry is from like uh, Salvador, Mexico, other parts of Central and South America. Um, and so it's sort of like a spinoff. And I'm like, okay, but you just did all of this work to get like the narrative changed from, hey, don't become a gangster. And now you've all decided to go and do this show that's going to, tell young guys to go and join motorcycle gangs again. We've seen it happen once and now we're going to see it happen again. Um, but they're all really uh -huh. nice. They're all really good looking. They're all really fun. And they treated me so incredibly well. And so I hung out with them for a bit. And then like my career and living in California, I just kind of like, again, I say yes to every, like every opportunity that I'm offered, I'm going to say yes to it because I don't want to like live with any kind of regret. And I also right. am very content with a very simple life. And so I don't look for these opportunities. They very much like come to me and- They find you. Yeah. And so that's almost like how I ended up moving out here. And I mean, like who wouldn't want to live in America? I've been to like so many other countries. Um, I was in Hong Kong during the fall of Hong Kong and I nearly moved there. I was very close to moving to Hong Kong and then like China was just like, just trashed it. Yeah. And I just like, there's nowhere better in, in my opinion, there's so nowhere better than America. So, yeah. That's an opinion that many of us share. Mm. Uh, so for all of our struggles uh, as a nation, uh, when you take a step back and you look at the rest of the world, um, this is such uh, 
hands down the greatest country in the history of the world as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so you're out in California. You're taking advantage of this opportunity presented to you. And you had mentioned earlier in the conversation that Ian, our mutual friend, you were the first person I guess he rescued from an abusive relationship. Is that right? I don't want to talk about something that maybe you're not comfortable with. No, but I'm, is, I'm is so this, ready. Is this where it happened then? No. Well, so a couple of things. First thing, um, it wasn't Ian. Ian introduced me to a man called Jeremiah Wilbur. You can find him on social media. Um, Jeremiah underscore Blackbeard. He runs this group called the War Party Movement. And I, I you know, like, okay. I, I'm really actually glad that you asked me this question. Um, and again, in true case, my fashion, I'm going to end up going off on a tangent here. So living in California, living in any city in California is an abusive relationship right now, firstly, because the amount of crime that's there. Mm. It's very dangerous to live there. But no, I was in for about a year. I've been in one very weird relationship and I have this theory that I'm sort of working on right now that most women who go through abusive relationships have to go through at least two before they break the cycle. And it's not, I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about, you know, hundreds of women that I've spoken to over the last uh, probably about two years of kind of realizing I was in a, a very abusive relationship that subsequently became very physically abusive. And then as soon as it became physically abusive, I was like, I'm out of here. And thank goodness I had mm. one friend who called me and was like, basically said point blank, he begged me like, do not go back because if you go back, this relationship will kill you. And so, or like words to that effect. And so I was in a very incredibly unique situation actually where I had gone through this sort of like sudden bout of violence and I had like a black eye like you know I looked like rough like I really looked very beaten up afterwards and um oh. I the next day had to go and record a show with Dr. Drew of all people um, we were talking about my work um, that at the time was very much focused on the homeless crisis. And I've been attacked by homeless people in Los Angeles as well. Um, some crazy guy had like, you know, almost tried to dox me on a bunch of forums. He got my address wrong, actually, but it basically said like, you know, go and like kill this chick. Um, so that was also oh happening at the time. Um, but I show up at Drew's house and he's like, hey, are you OK? And I real like it sort of like time slowed down. And I was like, I can either lie, which I'm terrible at, and say, hey, everything's fine. <laughs> or I can be completely honest with someone who is arguably the leading mental health expert in the world, who has worked with every wow. single avenue of mental health, whether it comes from like addiction or like, you know, kind of a biological issue, you know. What timing to have this scheduled, huh? Yeah. And he, and I just told him what happened. Um, his wife, Susan was there. Not only did they hook me up with the most incredible therapist, like on the spot, they talked me through it. They made me feel like they basically addressed it. Like exactly how you kind of, or how I needed it at that time. It wasn't like, oh no, I'm going to show you all this sympathy. It was oh, this is an awful thing, but it doesn't have to define you. And that was what I really wanted to ensure was that I wasn't defined. I didn't go into like every future relationship expecting to be abused. I didn't want to use it as a crutch because I have, I have met women who have been through and, you know, it's a scale and it's relative. Um, you know, if you go through any kind of abuse, it is relative. But when you have like, the, there is a little bit of a difference between being yelled at and having a gun pointed at your head, you know? And so like, mm -hmm. I didn't want to be like, oh, I'm like this eternal victim. And what Drew and Susan really managed to do was kind of take me out of that victim place immediately. And they were like, you are not a victim. You are a person who got caught up in a very bad situation and we can absolutely remedy this. And so they put me in touch with my therapist who was incredible. Um, I did a type of therapy called EMDR and then I did talk therapy. I only did eight sessions of EMDR, which is like almost like a mild hypnosis type thing. Um, and then I did talk therapy for about six months. And then um, that was when I'd like, you know, sort of saved up enough. I'd found a place out in North Carolina um, 
And that's when Jeremiah came, picked me up and moved me. But the other thing that those guys did, which was incredible, was um, this happened on the Saturday before Thanksgiving. And then I was there on the Sunday. And then I was like, oh my goodness. And I think Susan actually asked, she was like, well, what are you going to do for Thanksgiving now? And I was like, well, I don't know. And she was like, you're going to come do it with us. And this was like right in the middle of COVID. And so they usually would have oh, had wow. like a huge party like they would have had any other year. But it was basically me, Drew, Susan, their children, who are now some of my best friends in the whole universe. Like they raised such a great mm. family, like such a great family. Wow. And then Adam Carolla, who I didn't know who he was, but I was just like, uh-huh. oh, my God, <laughs> like, this is cool. Like, this is actually uh, You know what? I, I, I... <laughs> I used to listen to Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla do uh, Love Lines Mm -hmm. about 20 years ago. 25, my gosh, where does the time go? Over 20 years ago. And so I'm very familiar. So when you were talking about Dr. Drew, my mind goes back to that show uh, from a while back. But yeah, he's always seemed like a a great guy. And and you telling the story about he and his wife, uh, it just solidifies that. That's that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, he needs to be, you know, like... (sighs) Again, Susan's going to kill me for saying this, but like Drew should be in politics, like the good that he could do for this country. I mean, Mm. there's there's very few people like Drew who have like such a pure heart and who are really very like data and practically driven. He's the first person to admit when he gets something wrong. He's the first person to admit when he doesn't know like everything. And I think that that's like we need a little bit more of that, I think, like he's the most humble person you'll ever meet. But no, yeah, through mm. doing that with Drew, and then I actually got my own radio show. I've been I'd done like one season at that point, and then I did another season a couple of months later. Jeremiah, this uh, the guy who actually subsequently rescued me, met through Ian, and then just very quickly sort of realized like, oh, like there is like God brought us together for a reason, and I posted, mm. so I was like. <laughs> Joe Pags actually was like, hey, do you want to come and fill in for my radio show? Do you want to like do the full three hours? And I was like, absolutely. And I was working with someone at the time on the show who lived down in North Carolina. And so I was like, look, I'll fly out to North Carolina to record it because I don't want to do it here in L.A. And then I was trying to picture like driving back or like moving back to L.A. after recording the show. And I was like, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And so I posted on like Instagram. I was like, hey, does someone want to drive me? from Los Angeles to North Carolina, thinking no one would respond or like no one serious would respond. Jeremiah responded within, I think three minutes of me putting the post up. And he was like, I've wanted to get you out of there for so long. His wife, again, his wife, Jessica was just like, go and get her now. You should have rescued her forever ago. Like I was getting Mm -hmm. like daily death threats. It was not a fun place to be. And, you know, Mm. I couldn't have this conversation a year ago. Like I just, I wouldn't have been able to have it, but because of this incredible network of men and women, I've just, I completely, completely rebuilt me. And so, yeah, I blame Ian. I blame Drew. I blame Jeremiah. I blame Joe Pags. um, All these amazing (laughs) people for giving me this just unadulterated confidence in myself. Um, I really don't That's know. Great. I wouldn't be on you as well, Keith, you know, like you're like, you're one of the best people I've ever met ever. I was like, not surprised <laughs> when you and Ian, like when I was just like, oh, this is great. Like, these are two of the best people I know. And now they know each other. Like, this is magical. Um, it's a small world, huh? It's a very small world. So, so you're in North Carolina now mm-hmm. and you literally are a jack of all trades, quite frankly. I mean, you could, you can write, you can do a hit on a news network, uh, host a radio show. So there's obviously a lot to you, and that's present day, Kay. (laughs) Now, I want to talk about previous jobs you've held. You worked at a door? What, were you a bouncer at a bar? (laughs) I knew you were going to bring this up. Um, So I wasn't like a bouncer necessarily. Um... My, okay. my, I was trying to imagine you like intimidating people at the door. Like how, yeah. how tall are you? I'm like five, four when I'm lying about it. I'm like five, two in okay. reality. See? All, right. Yeah. All right. I was just trying to imagine you at the bar entrance. Like, no, you're not coming in here. Oh, I, that was so, me. That was me. Oh, it was? Yeah. Oh, is that is that what you did? Would, you would intimidate people and have them back off? Yeah. Well, like if people were getting on my nose, I'd be like, I don't like your shoes. Get out of here. 
No, um, I used to work, uh, my, my best friend back in Wales, um, chap Noah, he, uh, he started a jazz club that just like gentrified the entire city. It was the crazy, again, geography. It was the coolest thing. Um, started this jazz club, ended up buying another club, was a, a sort of regular slash DJ at a, like, in, in my opinion, the best nightclub of all time. It was called the Monkey Bar in Swansea. I miss it every single day. It doesn't even exist anymore. And hmm. I the monkey bar. That's a good. That is a great name for a bar. The monkey bar. <laughs> right? Isn't it great? <laughs> like it was. It was it. incredible. It was such a dive, but I loved. I just loved it. We were open till like five, six o'clock in the morning. Oh, it was amazing. Um, <laughs> but uh, Noah had me uh, doing payments on the door for the jazz club um, on Mondays. And he suddenly, I think he realized that I just had like the worst attitude. So like it was two, two pounds to get in. So like, you know, a, a, like maybe $3 at the very most. Okay. You would be amazed, Keith, how many grown men would be like, oh, I just want to go in to like use the bathroom and then I'm just going to sit outside. And I'm like, well, you're paying so that these guys over here can play music. Like that's what we're taking. Like I'm not taking money that's going to go to know or I'm like all of the money went towards mm -hmm. the musicians they would bring in who were like a lot of them were kids a lot of them were younger than me in school um that just mm. happened to be these brilliant musicians and so these people would come in and be like oh yeah I'm not gonna like you know I'm sat outside and I was like oh sound doesn't travel that far does it like dear ears just suddenly just like tune out the music as soon as you <laughs> walk through the door it's three quid wow you did intimidate them oh yeah you scared some guys I like I used to use <laughs> a lot of naughty words um, I remember one time this Wait, guy. you? Yeah, I know. Shocking, right? Um, but there was like this one time, this guy who looked like this. I remember he looked like a British politician called Alistair Darling. He had like white hair and these thick, dark caterpillar eyebrows. And he was like, it was like two pounds to get in. And he was like, oh, you know, I'm just going to like, you know, pop in, order my drink, and then I'm going to come sit back outside. And I was like, dude, if you can't afford two pounds to walk through this door, you need to go home and really work on yourself. Because I am not letting you through this door unless you pay that money. And honestly, I'd rather you go ahead and get the help you need. And I remember like, seeing him at like a house party like years later that one of my friend's like uh, mothers threw. And he was like, you know, you were really mean when he worked on the door at Noah's. And I was just like, I don't care. You're really cheap. Get out of my face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's my oh, attitude. No. And like, so now whenever like someone from Swansea, like people from my hometown think I'm like this very intimidating person. Cause I did that then at like other bars and other nightclubs. And like, I just, the power just went straight to my head, man. Like I was a uh -huh, nightmare. Uh -huh. It was terrible. Like I remember this one time, like the only millionaire in Swansea <laughs> tried to come through the door. And I knew who he was. And he's like, oh, I know Noah. And I was like, oh my God, me too. It's still a tenor to come in. Oh, I was just... <laughs> It was just difficult. I was just That's weird. understandable. I mean, you had a job to do and you did it well. I mean, so, I did have big scary bouncers around me who like when things really kicked off, I'd be uh -huh. like, I need a grown up. I need a man. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> where did you work with cannabis? Uh, that was pretty much. So I actually wrote my dissertation on cannabis um, on the sort of like social aspects of like why we need legalization. And then when I moved out mm -hmm. here, the legalization campaign was in like full swing in California. And I just submitted a bunch of like research that I already had that I'd been collecting um, to an outlet called the Cannabis Industry Journal, not knowing, like I didn't realize at the time that it was, and probably to this day, like one of the top rated and most respected journals on the cannabis business and the science of cannabis in the industry and the editor there whose name escapes me right now i mean this was you know like six years ago or something um published my pieces and all of these like people who didn't even like smoke weed um these people who were like investors who you know were really in the sort of like technological business you know yeah like tech and business side of cannabis read it and one of those guys uh, at the time was, and like I, I, from there again, it just sort of like, it just bubbled up. Like a lot of people were like sharing the content. I met some people who to this day, I consider my best friends in the whole universe. 
Um, but one of those guys was a guy called Ryan Hamilton, who subsequently be, um, ended up basically running the marketing department for a can a huge cannabis company that um, actually got in a lot of trouble later. And it was so funny because I'd met him through like other businesses, and then he got this job uh, working for this huge cannabis company. And he was like, hey, we're doing this like big launch campaign, but we want to feature like real people who work and understand cannabis in the launch campaign for this company. Um, do you want to come and do this like little photo shoot that we we're doing? Like it's downtown LA. Um, we'll just use you for like 20 minutes. We'll, you know, we can like pay you to be like, you know, you're a writer. So we'll pay you as a writer and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so I was just like, yeah, cool. Like, sounds good. Like thinking it would just be like a social media thing. And then about three months later, uh, I was walking down towards my very first apartment in Venice beach, right by the canals. It was a dungeon worst place I've ever lived. Um, (laughs) and I get this text from this guy, Ryan, and it's just a photo of my face on a huge billboard at the end of my blog. And I was like, what? what um what did you do and he was like well you know like you're part of the campaign and I'm like yeah dude but like I'm everywhere and they put me on sunset like I remember I had a boyfriend at the time we got into like an argument and so he went out for a drive and he was like I went out to get away from you and all I could see is your face everywhere (laughs) everywhere (laughs) that is awesome it was great yeah and so things kind of get ramped up from there again and so um i just wrote a piece last year for um about this incredible guy ron brandon who uh runs a company called kingston royal out of california does a lot of like the so yeah he is the social Mm. equity guru of cannabis and he was one who like dragged me back into uh writing more for like mainstream media because i've just been private sector for a long time so yeah it was uh okay. i can't i can't so avoid I, it i dude. gotta <laughs> uh, right right i gotta ask a girl from south wales how does she get into country music dude how do you not get into country music is the real question here i don't trust Uh-oh. people who don't Uh-oh. like country so i grew up on like the more sort of bluesy so hold on folk side uh-huh hold on Hold on. No, I feel like I have to defend myself here. Okay. Hang on a second. Oh my God. Do you not like Um, country music? I don't as a general rule. However, (sighs) I have exceptions and those are very few and far between. Mm -hmm. But who are your exceptions? um, I absolutely love Garth Brooks' greatest hit CD. Mm -hmm. (laughs) CD. Look how old I am. (laughs) Um, I I do enjoy Johnny Cash. Mm hmm. And um, Devil Went Down to Georgia. Uh, I will uh, listen to that. And. you know, other than that, eh, doesn't do anything for me. Okay, I'm going to make you a playlist because I just, I... You can make me a playlist, but it has to include Charlie Daniels, Garth Brooks, and Johnny Cash. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but I'm going to interject it with some of my favorite country musicians. So I just went and saw um, Craig Morgan last year. Um absolutely incredible singer like one of the best shows i've ever been to um even though we weren't allowed okay. to get up and dance because of like the rules or whatever in the place but like whatever um, oh I know. Gosh. a covid rule it was yeah i was not wait. happy uh, uh, wait wait hold on hold on does dancing spread covid now Dear fun spreads covid that's the rules <laughs> fun Fun spreads COVID. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, so you went to this concert, huh? And it was a good time? Well, like, my dad's, like, super shut up. My dad is super into all types of music. I grew up listening to, like, James Taylor and, like, a lot of the sort of, like, more classic Eagles, that kind of, like, classic blues, folky rock and roll. And then also, like, a lot of gypsy folk, like Ozark Mountain Daredevils things like that. And then Mm. when I moved out to America, I was like, what is American culture? American culture is country music. And okay, (laughs) I might get in trouble for saying this because as a general rule, like my first love was a musician and um, he still goes for like dinner at my parents' house. But (laughs) since then I was like, I don't date musicians. I just do not do it. Like, you know, I love musicians, but like, I will not date them. And then I saw Morgan Mm. Wallen on television Uh and i was like who Uh is this mulleted tall (laughs) glass of redneck water 
I was like, mm, that's a nice little can of PBR right there. Yes. Um, and then I listened to his music <laughs> and I was like, stick a fork in me. I am done. Like I would like, I honestly, I don't get starstruck. I really don't. Other than one time yeah. I met the woman who created weeds and orange is the new black. And I fan girl so hard over her. But I heard Morgan Wallen <laughs> and I just like something inside me changed. I swear to God. I was like, wow, this guy's music rips my soul to ribbons. And then I have a really good friend who kept sending me country music. And from there, I sort of discovered like, honestly, just like, like as much as I could possibly get. Um, oh, and wow. then Craig Morgan, I went after I went and saw him, I was like, wow, this guy is absolutely insatiable like i've never heard like what i love about country music is it's poetry turned into a hymn that becomes an anthem and that's like it's it's so many different it plays on so many different emotions and it's so intricately mm. developed and like i'm a bit of a poetry like novice i don't really know a lot about poetry i have like a couple that i like and you know i grew up with obviously dylan thomas and stuff like that but um obviously obviously well actually he was born on the road next to where i was born but <laughs> I have like no idea. you know okay um he's like the only welsh people. was like oh do you know Catherine zia jones and dylan thomas and i'm like yeah those are the only two welsh people that's fine <laughs> anthony hopkins like yeah but um uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, no. And then like, yeah, Morgan Wallen definitely like started me on that trajectory. And then like he got canceled for a minute and then he came back and I was like, yes, this is my man. Um, but he's, mm. yeah, I was, I'm a big fan. Like you should really check out his stuff. I think a lot of people like he's not real country music. And I'm like, he absolutely is. And okay. Mm. This is my last kind of like thing about country. So when I moved out to North Carolina, I had a friend out here whose husband is actually a country music uh, DJ. So he has like a, a radio show. It's a Mandarin mic in the mornings on QDR. And they had all of this like furniture at their place and also a lot of cats. And they were like, hey, we want to get rid of this furniture. Do you want it? And also here's like a bunch of amazing gifts for the cats. And so I like, you know, they, they <laughs> kitted me out. It was great. I got like the table that I'm currently using. And so after listening, you know, every morning now really to Mike and Amanda, I'm just like, I'm, you know, you cut me, I bleed red, white, and blue. I love it. I love my country <laughs> music. I just, you really don't Very like cool. it. What do you not like about I, it, dude? I don't like the sound. I don't, I don't, I just, I mean, what I don't know how to explain this other than it's just not my... <laughs> my cup of tea, um, generally speaking. Oh, my god! I didn't know I was going to be judged today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, you mentioned your dad. Mm -hmm. Big influence on your life. Uh, tell us about him. Oh, my dad's the best. I've never seen my dad judge anyone. I mean, like, he takes the mick out of me. Like, I mean, I no, I always like to say that no one makes better fun Hold on of me than me. Wait, he takes the mick out of you? You're going to have to explain this to Georgia boy here. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I guess, like, that word has, like, negative connotations out here, but it's not, like, it's not a derogatory term. I've never all. heard it. Okay, so it okay. basically uh, to take the mick out of someone is like make fun of them. He just never lets me get away with anything, but he also never judges anyone for anything. And I've never known anyone who's like, I've never met anyone who works as hard as my parents worked, but hmm. I've also never met anyone who take real pleasure out of the simplest things in life. Like they... As an only child, you know, I think it was a lot easier for them to raise me. And we had some, you know, incredible experiences. I mean, like I traveled the world before I turned like 12 years old. And that's all because of like my Yeah, mom's, it sounds like it. Yeah. like, and, But that's all because of like my mom's financial literacy because they worked so hard. We didn't spend money on like a fancy TV or like fancy cars. Like, you know, stuff was never important. Stuff was always replaceable and related to status. Whereas it was like well, you know, we don't need nice things. We just need a good, happy, healthy, you know, life. It's, it's, it's substance over style. Um, and I have no style as a result, which is fine. Um, <laughs> you know, I literally wear my dad's old jeans, like, you know, um, but he, yeah, he's just, 
for someone who didn't want kids and then my parents had me very late in life like they were well into their 30s when my mom um finally got pregnant and my dad was like not a fan like didn't he, he just didn't want kids and then as soon as I was born he was like let's have 12 more my mom was just like no she's fine <laughs> and I think it it really having a dad like my dad like I think if someone ever said anything mean to his face he would be kind of like the first person to be like okay but like let's understand how you got to that place in your mentality because you're not like mm you didn't get to this place from nowhere. Like how can I kind of like evolve your mentality? Whereas I would just go in and be like, I'm going to beat you up for saying that about my dad. Um, right. But he like, but then he also does this thing. Like one time he came out to visit, he, he comes out like a lot on his own. Cause we love to do like a lot of hiking, a lot of just like hanging out basically. And he came out mm -hmm. one time and he got a sociology degree and you know, for, one of a better word, like I got a geography degree, but I'm a sociologist really by trade. Um, and I was like, well, you know, sociology is a science. And he's like, no, it's not. Dude, we debated for three freaking days. And then in the end, I was like, we didn't talk about anything else. It was just this one freaking debate. <laughs> and then by the end of it, I was just like, here's my logic, which I can't even remember now because this is a long time ago. I was like, here's my logic. And I don't think you can argue with this. And he goes, huh, yeah, you finally got there. Well done. And I was like, oh, <laughs> he's just. Oh, he sounds like a great dad. Never answered a question. <laughs> never. If I ever asked my dad a question, he would turn around and be like, figure it out. Like, you've got enough knowledge. You've got enough understanding. You know, he did all the traditional stuff. Like, you know, he read me all the Harry Potters and did the voices. And my mom actually taught me how to ride a bike. It's just, like, they're just really good people. Like, I don't think I realized it until I got a little bit older and I, you know, had to go through some like not very nice life experiences, but they just, I just, just, I got lucky, I guess. Like I just got really good parents. Yeah. Um, you know, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. And, and you talked about how you and your dad, he'd come out and go hiking with you there in California. Other hobbies of yours are singing and walking. You list those. When I saw that answer, I don't know why I thought of this, but you, and, and it's only been encapsulized by the energy that you present in this conversation. It feels like you're a power walker. Do I have that right? Yes. And my dog hates it. I'm <laughs> like, I know where I'm going and I'm going to get that like right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Just, just, it was just a hunch. And I'm so glad we got there. It didn't take much. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the last book you read, and I've read this too. And I feel like, I don't know if I set my expectations too high or if it just was over my head, but I feel like I'm the only person, and since you bring this book up, I'm going to mention this. I feel like I'm the only person who didn't think The Alchemist was everything that it should have been. It just seemed like it had potential the entire book. It just didn't do it for me. Am I? Did I miss something major here that the rest of humanity has grasped? Um, oh, I love The Alchemist. Um, See, so, I mean, no. Like, I think, you know, you and I should I, hate each other. I don't. Because we dislike I, things, you know, like we don't have enough in common and we're supposed to hate people who don't have all the same opinions right. as us these days. Oh, exactly, you know? exactly. But see, now, I, I don't hate The Alchemist. <laughs> I just feel like it was a letdown, and 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 I don't go out on the fiction limb very often. Mm, okay, I like historic type books, or it, it, maybe historic fiction is really good. The only book I know I've said this a million times. The only book I've ever read twice was *To Kill a Mockingbird*. Mm. Um, and it now seems like a, a prerequisite for every one of these conversations on this podcast that I have to bring up Captains and the Kings. I love that book. That's fiction, but it's based in history. It's based in the past. And The Alchemist, it just, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I just was expecting enlightenment. I was expecting to read this book and then when I closed the book for the last time, I was supposed to walk away and have a new perspective on life. And instead, I think I was the only person who closed that book when getting to the end and went, eh, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I can completely see, I mean, it, it, it ends so abruptly and I don't want to give too many spoilers to people listening who maybe haven't read it. I have a completely different opinion 
uh, to Keith on this, <laughs> but uh, I, I try to read it once Everybody a year. Everybody does. You know, there's a couple of books oh, wow. that I read once a year. Like I do that. I do Into Thin Air. Um, there's a couple of John Krakow books that I love. Um, and then actually, since I guess I sent all of that stuff over to you, I also just read... Um, Oh god, what's it called? Where the crawdads sing? That's like the only fiction I've read in a long time. I do like Carl Hyacin though. If you ever read his books, they're really weird. But going back to the hold on, that's come up. That's come up before. Oh really? Um, on this program, and yep, there it is. <laughs> Laura Black. I had to go and check me my. my uh, I, as you said that, I was like, that sounds familiar, and I just checked my email, and uh, yeah, so that's a previous uh, previous ATM. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, which one? Carl Hyacin or uh, Where the Crawdads Sing? Uh, where the Crawdads Sing. Oh, that's a good book. I'm going to order you a copy of that book. It's really good. <laughs> no, um, no. Yeah, no, you'll enjoy it. Don't worry, it's nothing like The Alchemist. Um, but no, I, I get why you didn't <laughs> like it. Oh, sh- shut up. I'm give- sending you a gift. Uh um uh, i'm not it's send an audio book <laughs> okay i'll send you send the, I'll link, send you the link okay that's fair um i'm also reading dreamland right now by sam surname i can't remember um but anyway alchemist stay on topic okay um <laughs> i understand why because it, it ends so abruptly and it's sort of like you're expecting something you know, yeah, I, ex- I I get it. Like you're expecting something revolutionary. And then the way that it ends, I think is it's very sudden. And I think what I loved about it, and maybe this is more like my personality, but I don't like, there are a few things that I plan for in life, right? Like I knew that I wanted to be a writer and I mean, it took me until I was like 28 years old and I started when I was 11. Um, It took me until like, yeah, the last year for me to be like, oh my gosh, I'm actually a professional writer. I actually did that. Wow. Okay. No wonder. You get paid for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but I also, it's like, no wonder I'm so freaking poor. Um, But, uh, (laughs) I, uh, (laughs) but like for me, life is so much about the journey and I make decisions not based on what I can get from that situation, but from how I'm going to be able to look back on my life because everything we do eventually, you know, whether it takes us five seconds or, you know, 50 years, all of it becomes a memory. And like, I watched a documentary years ago, again, with my dad, it was a physics documentary on the end of the solar system. And right at the end of this documentary, this guy describes how the planet becomes like, the theory is that the planet will become vaporized by our expanding sun. Um, And for some reason afterwards, me and my dad just kind of said, like, I don't know if we were like, you know, I think we'd had a little bit of wine or whatever. But like we were sat there just like, wow, life is meaningless. And then it that very quickly became a <laughs> feeling of like, wait, it's not meaningless. It just means that life, and this is going to sound so cliche, but life is about the journey that we go through that leads to these like sudden like sort of sparks of moments. Like, you know, for me, like camping out in Arizona in the back of the truck, like that was a big moment um, for me last year that, was incredibly grounding and something I'll like never forget kind of thing. Or, you know, it's uh, Mm -hmm. my first like big TV hit. I did just get bumped by Fox twice. Not that I'm bitter about it. It's fine. Um, But, um, (laughs) you know, there's like little things that like I never planned for ever. Like there are no things that I ever planned for that I've been able to live through. And as a result of those things, I've been able to continue on this like very fascinating journey. And so like, there are certain things I plan for, like I said, like I plan to become a writer, you know, my next sort of like life goal is to have at least sort of like 10 acres of arable land. Everyone keeps saying this, this these days, they're like, oh, I'm gonna go like run my own farm. And I'm just like, unless you've actually run your own farm or like run a small holding, like it's not gonna happen for you. You can't like Pinterest this stuff hard work and you just have to accept that it's a <laughs> slow life it's kind of miserable and i'm all for it i cannot wait um again that's how i grew up but like <laughs> there's little things like that that i you know plan for but i don't expect it to happen overnight i expect it to take right. a, you know a very long time it took me a very long time to become a writer like it's going to take me just as long to get to that kind of lifestyle that i want and you know there's other things like i'd like to be married i really want to have kids 
Um, but that, mm -hmm. you know, takes another person being involved. And so, you know, I can't plan for that as well. But what I, what I really took away from The Alchemist was if you listen to those, what if you have done acid? Oh, I'm going to ask you about that. That's okay. I'm, okay. I'm glad because you, you list that as the biggest turning point in your life, doing acid. Yeah, that, that oof, I mean, I would not recommend it to anyone, but it was, it was the best thing I'd ever done for myself, I think. Certainly at that point, um, probably is why I'm here now. It was a very long time ago. But um, I think if you have like a little bit of faith and you don't overthink the journey that you're on, it allows you to be more maybe appreciative of the very small things that you have in life. And I think it allows you to kind of like find your treasure, even in like the worst situations. And like, again, I hate, I'm sorry if this is like a spoiler for people listening, but you know, right at the end of The Alchemist, you know, this kid, he's been on this like enormous journey and he's, you know, getting really badly beaten up. And one sentence from one of the guys beating him changes the entire course of his life all over again it you know after everything he's been through even at his very like bottom 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 he gets this tiny little gift that sets him on a journey all over again and like that is what i love like i'm a bit of an optimist like i'm a bit of a sucker for like being one of these like realistic optimists but sometimes i go too far in the optimist direction um as a result probably of the acid but um I, uh, that's what I really loved about it, you know, and it was a gift from a friend and he also bought me Siddhartha, which is another great book that sort of like, it's like one of those books where like everything happens, nothing happens, then it ends and you're just like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So wait, but, but why do you attribute doing acid to not only the biggest turning point in your life, but you listed it just a moment ago as a very positive thing for the trajectory of your life. How so? Um, well, you know, I said something um, earlier, like, you know, you have, I, I have this theory that you have to go through two abusive relationships to really sort of like, I like see that cycle and then break it. And so mm -hmm. I had been in a pretty not very nice relationship, but it was a bit, I don't want to get too into it right now, but it was just weird, dude. Like he wasn't mm. like a mean guy, but like turned out to be a complete psycho kind of thing. Um, mm. And so I left that relationship, was like living alone. And I think I was in a very vulnerable place. And there are a lot of people who were trying to take advantage of me at that point. Like I was on all these billboards, you know, I was sort of like everywhere at the time, especially like people in the weed industry. There was like a lot of like very bad actors. And there was one in particular who owed me, to this day, he owes me a lot of money um oh yeah no. oh yeah i want to i want to hear about a couple of experiences that you had where you nearly got blown up and you ran down an erupting volcano what in the world have you been like on movie sets what what's the story there um well the blow up thing that was like my parents get annoyed when i talk about this that happened in morocco <laughs> the first time and we were like just leaving marrakesh as this cafe got blown up one time i was running through marylebone station in london and this kid was cleaning the floor with his prema and i look at my boyfriend and i'm like dude, it's not cool to prayer right now. And he was like, oh my goodness, you're right. And so this kid had this backpack on that was like the same size as me. And actually that boyfriend had um, been on the train before the one that got blown up on the 7-7 bombings. And so he and I just start yeah. sprinting through the train station. And as he's kind of like dragging me around this corner, I look back and this kid's being like dragged into the back of a white van by a bunch of guys who looked very scary. Um, who I assume were like wow. some kind of, you know, MI6, MI5 type thing. I don't know. Um, so it was that. And then the volcano. Well, that's my blimmin' dad's fault. So he's like, let's go to Italy and go hike <laughs> up this volcano because like we can go and do it real cheap. And I'm like, yeah, uh, that sounds freaking sick. So we go up this volcano and like, hey, dad, look over there. And we look down the side of this volcano. We're probably like about 600 feet from the summit at this point. And I'm like, that looks like like there's this kind of hole in the ground and all of this um, ash is coming out. And I'm like, that looks like a vent that's just opened. And that usually happens during an eruption. 
And my dad, who doesn't have a degree in this, who doesn't know anything about like the geology of this stuff. Really, I mean, like he does, he's very well read. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's a vent that's just opened, which means that this volcano might be erupting. And my dad's like, no, it's fine. Let's carry on. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so we keep going up this blimmin' volcano. And then I'm looking at it and I'm like, so it was Mount Etna on Sicily um, in Italy. And Mount Etna, it, it's sort of like, it's a very interesting, like the geology of Etna, I'm not going to get into it because I'll probably get it wrong, but it creates its own weather system because it's like, uh, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a very active volcano and there's a lot of heat that comes out of the top. And um, as a result, a lot of water condenses as it's coming over and like, it just, it's kind of cool. Like you can watch these weather systems being created. And so we're going up and I'm like, all of a sudden, these white sort of clouds that were being formed are now gray, like as in ash. And so I'm like, dad, mm. I'm pretty sure this is not a good situation. My dad's like, <laughs> no, it's fine. Like we're nearly there. And so we're within like probably 200 feet of the summit. And this truck pulls up and this Italian guy gets up like, oh no, the volcano is erupting. You have to go now. I have to go get more people from the summit. And so we just, like, I was like, I freaking told you so. I used much stronger words than that. And I was like, I really told you so. <laughs> and so we just go hurtling down the side of this volcano. Like it probably took about four or five hours to get up as high as we did, maybe more. And it took us probably oh, like 20, God. 30 minutes to get back down because we were running so fast. I had shin splints for a month afterwards. And as we get into this oh. tiny, crappy little Fiat, I don't know if you've ever driven in Italy, but it's very dangerous. Those guys are insane. No. So we're driving like round these like tiny little Italian streets in what was, you know, ostensibly just a tin can. And like all this ash, they create these things called lahars, which are like mud flows. So like the entire road is just like getting washed away. Dude, it was, it was the, it's, <laughs> I'm not even going into like as much detail as I could because it was one of the most ridiculous situations I've ever been in. And like to this day, me and my dad, like, I can't, I can't use the words that he used, but like later that night, uh, we went out for food. Cause like, I guess like the, the ash had kind of stopped and we were hungry. So he goes to this restaurant. We're walking back to, um, this, uh, I don't even know what you would call it. Like an apartment that we rented, I guess. Um, and my dad's walking ahead of me, maybe like 10 feet ahead of me. And like, you think I power walk like this man power walks, but, uh, he walks into the square in this little village, um, in Sicily. And all I hear is him swear as loud as humanly possible. And there's a bunch of nuns standing outside the cathedral, like, you know, 20 feet away. And they look at him and then they look up and I'm like, what is he swearing about? And I run around the corner and the volcano at this point is probably like 15 miles away. And we could feel the heat of the lava flow from that distance because it was just, I got a picture of it somewhere on my um, Instagram. I have to send it to you because I have never seen anything like it. And so we just went and sat wow. on the roof of this building like for hours into the night, just watching this thing erupt. There was like, a, like an 11 mile or 11 kilometer, I can't remember, like lava flow. It was insane. Mm. We were the last plane actually off Sicily the next day and it was very scary. But um, my gosh, yeah, well, was, I don't know. So, uh, in your life, uh, you've already you know accomplished so much, seen so much. You've had a lot of encounters with celebrities. Any stories, good or bad, that you are able to share with us? Mm, um, <laughs> mm, uh, ugh, celebs. I'm trying to be like nicer about celebrities these days because, like, I keep. Especially when I was back in LA, like I didn't really care. But like now, whenever I go to New York, I'm like, okay, I should probably be a little bit nicer because, you know, I can be. Um, Have you been mean to them in the past? I mean, I've mouthed off at people before, <laughs> like, sure. Um, but like, I'll mouth <laughs> off at anyone. Like, if someone comes out with something stupid, I'm going to be like, that's dumb. Um, but, you know, I also expect people to say the same back to me. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think like off the top of my head. I mean, you know, I, I would count like Dr. Drew is obviously like a celebrity um, being able to do Thanksgiving with like him and Adam Carolla was obviously pretty cool. I didn't know anything about Adam before I met him. 
Um, right. And I just knew that he like smoked American spirits and I also smoked American spirits at that point. And I was like, Hey, this is great. <laughs> um, but, uh, God, like they're so commonplace. Oh, one time I think I told one of the guys who played Spider-Man back in the day to F off. Um, and then I've also had like a handful of celebrities come on my podcast and all of them have been like so lovely. Um, just so lovely. Like there's no one really that I can think off the top of my head. Oh God, I should probably have been better prepared for this question. Um, that's okay. I don't know. That's fine. Did I write and did you ask that on the email that you sent? Yeah, you said, um, I, I asked cross paths with celebrities or famous people. You said so many don't know where to begin with this one. Literally all of them. It was one of those things where like, <laughs> so there was this one actor like back in the day where I was like, oh my God, he's so good looking. Like I'm definitely gonna <laughs> like meet him one day and like, we're gonna have like a thing and it's gonna be great. And then everyone was like, that's never going to happen. I was like, yeah, it's probably never going to happen. And then I downloaded an Instagram. He was literally the first person to slip in my DMs. And I was like, dude, what? We ended up dating on and off for like a couple of years. Nicest guy under the sun. Like, so lovely. Um, but yeah, I just like, I well, I lived in Venice Beach back when Venice was like the happening spot. Um, so that was cool. Um, and then I got to meet a lot through like friends as well. Because like, it, it, you get it. Like, it's a very small world. <laughs> now, if you could go back in history, you'd like to meet the Druids, mm -hmm. and you would also like to meet Mark Antony. Uh, Mark Anthony. And just wondering why you picked those two. So, okay, here's the thing. I should clarify. I wish that we had never left the cave, like, as a species. Like, I do not see the point in, like, 99% of what we've done as a species, but that's, like, a whole <laughs> other avenue. Um, okay. The Druids, it's more just sort of like, hey, my people, you know, like, the Romans gave you such a bad rap, guys. Like, I'd love to know what it's really all about. Um <laughs> you know, history is written by the winners and all that. Um, but Mark Anthony, I was listening to a podcast years ago about Cleopatra, and they told this story about how Mark Anthony used to get really drunk. Like, he was just, like, a bit of a bro. I guess one time <laughs> he had to, like, s like give some speech or whatever. Uh, like, I don't even, I don't really, I'm not a good, I'm not good at history. Um, but he had to give some like huge speech and he stood up after like, and he'd been drinking the night before and he stood up too fast, I guess, before making the speech. And so he stands up like ready to go and then immediately just like vomits everywhere and then just carries on with what he's doing. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds like my kind of friend. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's that. They don't, they don't put that story in the history book. Yeah. Because I'm like the queen of the tactical sickie. Like for some reason, the women in my family, we boot and rally like, like, oh, it's disgusting. But I'm really good at it. Um, and so, yeah, like when, after I heard that story, I was like, dude, I'd love to meet that guy. But like, no, most people from history, I'm just like, I don't know, like maybe like Chinggis Khan. Like, I think that would be cool. Apparently that's the correct way to pronounce it, according to my like angry Korean friends um oh wow I don't know. okay i know i just get in trouble if huh. i say it any other way but um all right um what is currently in your amazon cart uh or or something you've recently purchased you'd like to share with the class oh good question let me um let me actually look i'm not a huge fan of jeff amazon so i tried not to like use his stuff too much um mm -hmm. let me see let me see Oh, I tried to buy a cactus growing kit for someone at Christmas, but it got really bad reviews. Do you know what I love? Oh, Dreamland, which I now have by uh, Sam Quinones, and then The Least of Us, which I've also been given, so I didn't buy it. And then, dude, I have a thing where one of my friends who I think we both know, actually, um, likes to say that I dress like a commie. Like I dress like a communist because I love wearing sweats. So I I buy a lot of like matching sweats. Like I had to stop. What's wrong with sweats? Who says this? It's, it's, it's... Now I'm just curious. How how is communism and sweatpants? How how are those connected? I have no idea. But no, Buck Sexton always says that I dress like a communist. <laughs> um, and like I used to have like a <laughs> nose ring, which I've like subsequently mm -hmm. like stopped. Like I just have a stud in there now. And he's always just like, 
why can't you wear like pretty girly clothes? And I'm like, I do. I just don't take pictures in pretty girly clothes. Cause like, I'm usually rushing to like leave and go outside so people can see me in them in real life. When I'm at home, I'm either in a robe or I'm in my sweats. And so I don't buy that many. I usually end up like just getting given them or like, uh, I'll go there's like, this an amazing thrift shop around the corner from where I live. Um, I buy a lot of pairs of matching sweats from the thrift shop. Um, and then I have some saved on my Amazon, but I just, I won't buy them because I don't like Jeff Amazon. Um, but yeah, that's Noted. just me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very cool. Uh, is, have we covered everything? Anything that we need to uh, touch on here that we haven't? We've covered a lot of ground. I kind of want you to like answer all of the questions that you asked me. I guess yeah. like that's one of my, yeah, see- when are you coming on my show? Like that's what uh, I don't know. So you can talk about how much you hate country music uh, and camping and all the things I love. I'll come on your show sometime. <laughs> we'll we'll make it happen. Um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, a lot of people have asked me when am I going to answer some of these questions. I don't know. Well, I, I, someday we'll figure out a good venue for that, and uh, I'll do that. But um, I appreciate you making the time. Where can where are the places that people can find you online? Okay. Uh, so just casemythe.com is K-A-Y-S-M-Y-T-H-E. Blame my parents for that one. Eventually I'll get married and I won't have such a stupid name. Um, <laughs> what? But, what uh, is so <laughs> I don't follow you. <laughs> I hate my name. It's like the dumbest name ever. It sounds like a sneeze, like Case Um <laughs> But uh, yeah, so... <laughs> just case my but you know the that good is... thing is just case my if you google me you'll find me i'm on twitter i'm on instagram oh. getter free space freaking patreon but my patreon is case my case my um i did have a facebook i think mm. i still have one because i have to use one for the daily caller you can find like my now, hang on is it just one-stop shopping, casemythe.com, got all of these links? Yeah, just go casemythe.com. It's just so much Perfect. easier. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so much easier. All right, Case Mythe, thanks so much for making time for At The Mic. I really appreciate it. Dude, thank you so much for having me and putting up with my wittering. Like, I just I just can't appreciate you enough, Keith. Like, I'm sure that you were like, hey, it'll be fun. It'll be great. Like, it'll be chill. No, yeah. I stopped smoking pot a no. long time ago. I got a lot of words. Thank <laughs> you. Just- Hang on. I'm looking up. I'm looking up wittering. I put up with your wittering. I put up with what? Oh. Uh, uh, your your. <laughs> so have you ever seen a cat Wait, see is... a bird through a window and they're like, <laughs> and they make that noise? Yeah. That's wittering. Yeah, I used to have one like that. Yeah, that's wittering. Oh, is it really? Yeah. I never knew a word for it. I just called it. I, I think I just made the same sound you just did to describe it, but I didn't know how to word. Okay, very good. All right. Well, Case Mythe, thanks so much. Uh, Casemythe.com. Uh, you have a great one. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It was great getting to talk with Kay, and I absolutely dig the accent. I guess I wonder if she ever gets used to our accent in this country. I guess I should have asked her that. I mean, that would have been a good question, uh, considering I just spoke with her for over an hour. I could have slipped that question. Anyway, if you listen to this podcast and you enjoy it, and I hope you do, I hope that you will tell others about it, and I hope that you will also rate and review it please give it five stars, either at Apple iTunes or Spotify. Now, looking ahead to our next episode of At The Mic, we're going to sit down for a conversation with Shannon Bream from the Fox News Channel. She has a story to tell for sure as we learn about the personality you see on cable news. There's a lot more to Shannon than just bringing you current events, and that's next week's episode on At The Mic. Until then... Feel free to drop us a note through the website at themicshow.com. And don't forget, merchandise is available through at themicshop.com. Now, before you do anything, you know I'm going to ask you to please go be free. And thank you for listening. This has been At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Head to at themicshow.com for archived episodes, sponsor information, and ways to connect. 